Listen to me, you hillbilly punk who thinks the world's still round. I'm here to tell you it's not. It's flat! <laughs> Interesting guy, man, and uh, you know he believes it. So, Kyrie, the Earth is flat, right? Yeah. 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 So whatever. That's news. That's news. Here we go. <laughs> this is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones, obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> Broadcasting straight to you from a large spaceship, currently anchored over Ambroy, California, watching Mad Mike prepare to launch himself over the town with his research flat earth homemade rocket. Meanwhile, the peanut gallery is anchored over HBO headquarters in New York City, monitoring the responses to the Vice News FEIC segment, which ran on HBO tonight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, the creator of Flat Earth Clues, which propose that all of us are living inside a Truman Show enclosed structure thousands of miles wide. Check it out at enclosedworld.com or just Google Flat Earth Clues. If you can't find it, oh, you've been really, really distracted by a lot of really big Flat Earth headlines that are happening right now, but we'll get to those in a second. For those of you listening to this on YouTube and you want to hear the show live... As it happens, please go to Truth Frequency Radio for the latest schedule. Currently, this show is on Tuesday nights at 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern. And if it is not November 21st, 2017, well, then you're not listening to it live and you're listening to a recording, which means if you call into the show tonight, it's going to be a partial call-in show because we do have a subject matter expert tonight. Uh, you're going to get voicemails. So that's fine. I, I will answer the voicemails, but you won't be able to talk to me live. So remember. If it's not the 21st, you call the number. It's just going to be ringing on my screen, but I'm not going to pick it up. I just, there's I just not enough time in the day. Quote of the day from the peanut gallery. It doesn't take a lot of strength to hang on. It takes a lot of strength to let go. That's from J.C. Watts. Announcements. Who's got the announcements? I do. First off, tomorrow... Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, The Secret Show, Patricia Steer's 200th episode. Can you believe that? She's been doing this that long. Two, first one of 200 I know in the Flat Earth community. 200 episodes tomorrow, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. I will be on it. There will be literally thousands of guests from this world and other dimensions. I, I don't know. Actually, there's a lot of people popping in, though, so don't be surprised. There's, there's going to be a lot of cameos. I, I can't really give you a list of movies that had a lot of cameos. There's a few that come to mind, but I don't think I'm going to do it justice. There's going to be a lot of cameos tomorrow. So by all means, drop by and say hi, and I, I will be the first one to do it. In fact, I will preempt my... All right, can anybody hear me at the moment? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, yes. Okay, so you can hear me, but am I on the radio? Yes. No. All right, I can hear you on the radio. Okay, so we're back up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Holy smokes. I don't know what that was. Okay. Um, <laughs> the last thing I was supposedly was doing was thank you, Patricia, for making it to 200, I think. And then everything died. S 
So tell you what we're going to do. We And the phone lines are not hooked up right now. I know everyone's calling at the moment. And we got some people in there. And so I don't know what happened. But we're just going to keep moving along and pretend like the first five or six minutes didn't happen. So let's uh, let's just news real quick. I want to say congrats to Flat Earth member Kyrie Irving and the Boston Celtics. As some of you may know, if you've been tracking the National Basketball Association here in the United States, the Flat Earth <coughs> Boston Celtics are currently at the top of the league. They're 16-2. and two. They're number one in the NBA right now. Kyrie Irving won in overtime last night, scored 47 points. He is totally a flat earther. And even the general manager, Danny Ainge, who's won a few championships himself back, back with Larry Bird in the 80s, he said, you know what? I, there may be something to this flat earth thing. You know how it goes. If you're winning whatever superstitious belief, whatever you're doing, if you're rubbing honey on the side of your basketball shoes, people will be like, oh, it's totally cool. I'm, I'm, I'm totally into that. So whatever. Hey, great. Fantastic. Uh, all the thing, because we won't get a, a second chance at this, best of luck and God speeds to uh, Mad Mike Hughes, who's going to be flying up in the flat earth rocket this Saturday out in the Mojave Desert, Route 66. This Saturday, November 25th. I don't know if any news media are going to cover it live, uh, but fantastic, great. I, I hope uh, hope it goes well for him. I hope you do not auger that thing into the ground like a drill. I really am <laughs> and super happy for you that you've got Flat Earth all over the side of that rocket. So, you know, does the fate of Flat Earth hinge with this? No, not necessarily. Uh, but... No, it's still kind of a cool thing. The other thing, and I know you guys are trying to call in right now. I do not have the phone lines currently hooked up, so whatever number you're dialing probably won't bounce off of of us yet. I'm going to wait during the first break before I attach the secondary phone line uh, because of what just happened now. And the last thing I was going to mention was, um, oh, I'm sorry, the website. So currently I know the peanut gallery is talking to me. Yes, that's where you left off. Thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, funny, Flat Earth News. No, I'm not going to read that on the air. Um, the enclosedworld.com is currently under construction. That is going to be rebuilt. And so you guys check it out when you get a chance. It's going to be super cool. It doesn't look like much at the moment, uh, but it needed some revamping. And so a special Flat Earth member who is not going to be named at the moment, maybe he'll take credit for it later, is going to rebuild the site for me because I just don't have the time or honestly the skill set really anymore because I'm doing the whole flat earth thing. And before I bring in, because remember this is a subject matter night and we're going to bring in, what, was, what am I going to title this? The Industrial Vacuum Expert. How's that? That sounds pretty good. We're not going to bring you in yet. Not yet, but we will in shortly. I know we've wasted like five minutes. That's okay. we got a couple hours. So hopefully this won't affect too much. And I'm sorry for the disconnect, you guys. Uh, anyone listening to this on YouTube won't hear the dead air that went on for like, what, four or five minutes? But that's fine. These things happen. I wanted to mention real quick, when it comes to haters, uh, Jaron did a wonderful thing recently where he was talking about there's doers and then there's armchair quarterbacks, people that criticize no matter what, no matter what you try to do, no matter what your intentions are, there's always people out there that are hating on stuff. And I want to tell you a little story, and I know you guys are going to groan because initially I'm going to say because it's from a video game standpoint, because as you guys know, I used to play video games for a living. And even in the happy, fluffy world of video games, there are still haters. It, it, and we're talking recreation, the, the most enjoyable form of recreation I can think of, in, unless you count sex, but that's a whole other thing. But let me, let me tell you a quick video game story. Back in the day, because and, and this is relevant because World of Warcraft just celebrated its 13th year anniversary just recently, just a couple days ago. And I've been playing for about 13 years. And some years ago, I was trying to go for a really cool pinnacle epiphany type moment in, in the world of video games, which is known in the world of Warcraft as a realm first. They don't do it anymore. But what would happen is you go into a game. As soon as a new expansion rolled out, you w- would be like the first one to get a certain skill set in something. The first one to get mining or the first one to take down a boss. or it, There are all these cool things. That, but there was only one. You can only do one. And when you got this thing, it was announced server-wide to everybody 
that you were the first one. You're like, so Mark Sargent has achieved this. And, and everyone, didn't matter what they were doing, didn't matter what chat room they were in, everyone got their announcement on you know, in, inside the game. And so I was trying for one of these. I was trying for Realm First, and you guys can look it up, in Pandaria, and this is geek talk here, for skinning. And that means I would max out my level of skinning as fast as I could. As soon as the expansion went online, you know, middle of the night, we'd play literally till sun up, and, and someone would try to get a realm first. And I played the beta, and everything was going great. And, and so the expansion was launched, and I run in there, and I go down to this far end of this map, and I'm, I'm working it, I'm working it, I'm basically skinning tigers. Uh, no offense to the vegetarians, they're digital tigers. No real tigers were harmed during this achievement. And I was I'm cranking it up, but then the diminishing law of returns was kicking in, and I just couldn't get high enough to finish it because the, the things that I was working on weren't a high enough level. And so there's going, great, I'm going to lose this because I have no, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm, I'm not going to be able to pull this thing off. So I was going, all right, well, you know what, I'm not going to get the realm first. So I'm just going to wander around up in these hills and just see what's up there. And why not? It's four in the morning. Why, why not check this out? So I go up into the hills and I'm just wandering around and it's up. You guys want to know where it was. It was where the first black market house was. And... When I was up there, I look over and there's pasture with these stupid little goats that happen to be just high enough for me to do this. And so I killed like eight or nine of them immediately. Mark Sargent has achieved this realm first. And you're probably saying, where are you going with this boring video game story? It is because when I got this and everyone was announced this realm first, almost immediately, the first three or four people that messaged me because they knew it was me and they have your address, their, your, uh, your little chat address. They messaged me with hate almost immediately because they were envious, because they were jealous. And it's like, oh, you hackered all sorts of profanity. You cheated. Boo, loser. I mean, these guys were actually upset. I'm going, look, I saw, you know, I sought out to do this thing. It was a fun, fun moment for me. And here you guys are. You're just hating on me because you wanted to do it first. And it's, it's, I get it. It's the spirit of competition. I get why people hate. And it's, there's a reason you can put this on a t-shirt. Envy is one of the seven. There's a reason for that. And I get it. Apply this to Flat Earth to the nth degree. Everybody knows that Flat Earth hasn't been touched. It's a virgin market out there when it comes to just about everything regarding it. And I understand why, why people get jealous. And I understand why, why people hate. But come on. Come on. It's still a great community. There's going to be people that are going to do bigger things. You know, I, I put in the legwork. I have. So you want to hate on me for that? Hey, fine. It just shows how small you are. Anyway, that's my little anti-troll speech. Let's bring in the guests, shall we? <laughs> All right, I'm going to do a quick announcement of him. Quick, quick intro. Oh, boy. Did I already screw up the thing? So Jerry Demaz. Hopefully I got that right, a.k.a. the Globe Vandal on YouTube, who worked as a maintenance repair technician for several years in a semiconductor manufacturing plant, maintaining and repairing ultra-high vacuum systems. And there's a reason I brought him on, and the reason is because, you know, in Flat Earth, we talk about vacuum the earth and space, supposedly the infinite vacuum of space, a lot. And so I wanted to get his opinion on vacuums in general. And I know we've only got seven or eight minutes to the first break because I screwed up the thing. And it wasn't my fault. I swear to God, the system kicked off. And hopefully it won't kick off again when I, when I do the phones at the first break. So, Jerry, all that being said, and uh, you've been very patient with me sitting through the dead air and the announcements and that fun video game story. Are you there? What? What? I think I just. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Thank no, you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Come on, I appreciate it. I, uh, my pleasure. So let's let's get right into it. Let, let, I don't know if we can get. Let, let's get into the vacuum thing in a bit. How did you get into flat Earth? Um, I got to kind of start a few years back. The first time I ever. Uh, was even introduced to the idea ironically was the kennedy space center in uh, florida i was off on a trip back then i was working for a car stereo manufacturer called phoenix gold 
we manufactured car audio amplifiers and things like that. And we were at the, I know you're going to, this is going to suck, but I was at Daytona beach spring break. And, uh, <laughs> and I've never been to one of those. So it sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, on our pre the day before it started, we decided to head on down and go over there and, uh, NASA, uh, well, not NASA, but Kennedy Space Center, um, we were in the auditorium, and they actually brought up the flat earth themselves um, <laughs> and saying, yeah, there's people out there that actually still believe in the flat earth, and, and they think we faked the moon landing, and I thought that was kind of odd that huh. they would mention that. And this was back in, like, 01 or 02. Wow. So this was quite a while ago, but way before... There was really anything going on. Hmm. Um, so I walked around, and uh, at the time, I was a fabricator. I was a new product development manager and a fabricator where I would design these ultra-high-end audio systems. I'd build demo vehicles, you know, six-figure demo vehicle stereo systems. Sure. And uh, so anyway, um, I knew a little bit about fabricating. And I took one look at that mock-up lunar module, <laughs> and I thought, holy hell, who who designed and built this? It looked like a joke. I, I, just, I, I, just, I just was in awe looking at that. And then you go and look at the rocket, and, you're, and it's really impressive. That was a, you know, that, the booster rocket was a completely different story. It was like you had two different teams on those things. <laughs> Um, the rockets were phenomenal, massive, huge. But then when it got over the lunar module, it's like, you know, got to credit Jake Gibson for his right. uh, homeless tweak tweaker shelter because right. that's what it looked like, man. Yep. Well, fast forward a couple of years, I went to work for another audio manufacturer, and um, this gentleman was actually a uh, a uh, engineer for tube amplifiers. And uh, he hands me a video and says, yeah, we didn't land on the moon. And I, like, laughed at him. I said, are you kidding me? You know, I just thought he was a nut job. Right. But the only reason why I gave any credence to it was because, you know, he was extremely well-educated. And, you know, it wasn't your typical weirdo trying to, you know, pass off some freaky conspiracy theory. Right. So I watched the video. Um, and once again, this was probably 05, I want to say. So this was well before the movement ever hit. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if it was the funny thing happened on the way to the moon video. It was so long ago. I, I can't, I just, I can't remember what it was. Okay. I just simply remember that it debunked a whole bunch of stuff. Most of the points we already know about. Right. And, and so then I thought, well, yeah, well, I didn't put two and two together that, hey, maybe the earth's flat or Maybe they were, you know, doing that to give us a fake shot of the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, in about three years ago, I started thumbing through the moon landing stuff and revisited it. And then that just led into Matt Powerland's video and, uh, of course, yours and Shazwar Booties. And I started watching all that and, and they had some really good valid points. And I thought to myself, wow, there's there's actually something to this. Yeah. Um, but I kept it to myself and I just kept researching because I wasn't about to go tell anyone and make myself look like an idiot nope. you know, and, yep. and lose any credibility I had. Right. And I wasn't going to go forth with it until I could have an intelligent conversation on the topic. Yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, when you first find Christ, you know, when you become a Christian or something, you get all excited and you, you want to share the message, right? Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes it's just too early, <laughs> you know, but the passion there was definitely there, but I just didn't want to come across wrong. So that's kind of how I got into it. Oh, and cool. then, you know, then I just kept going from there. And then I made my, I eventually, when I felt confident enough, decided to make a couple of videos. I have a full-time job, so I don't have a lot of time to make the videos I'd like to. Yeah. Um, so I made a few short ones where I saw a lot of infighting going on. I didn't like, and so I thought, hey, there's got to be a quicker way to get the message out there that's a little more heart lighthearted and uh, can still state the facts, but in a humorous way. 
And so I came up with, uh, you remember those Bud Light commercials, the real men of genius? Mm -hmm. Those were always my favorite. I just loved them. And uh, so I decided to do a spoof on those. So I was, I started in on a series for those. And uh, one of them was on the lunar module landing and I did it to the music and I, and I imitated the voice and everything. And, and like the, the lunar module thing, um, not the lunar module, but the, the curiosity rover on Mars. Oh, okay. Okay. And, And so what I did was I took all the pictures of like the walrus bones, the lichen, the lemming, the railroad ties, all the different evidences that were in NASA's photos. And I just, turned it into a bit of a comedy so go in there and check that out sometime okay that's not what i'm on here for today but (laughs) anyway there's my journey that's how i got to here awesome well that's great uh and and yeah i think the one you were mentioning was a funny thing happened on the way to the moon by jesus that bart sabrell was he the first guy to help put that thing together over in the uk that and yeah, you're right. That's a, that. If you believe in the moon missions, if you believe in the Apollo programs, you got to see that film because it, it shoots. Now, does it absolutely prove a flat Earth? No, no. As a matter of fact, I I have to think it was one of their backup plans that let them fall back. You know, so like even if you hated the Apollo program, you look at that little movie and say, well, yeah, but they faked it from Earth orbit, which means it's still a globe. Which which was yeah. clever. That part I thought was clever because you don't leak. You know that that film doesn't get leaked out anywhere. That film is put under lock and key. Anyway, yeah, that one that one really makes me wonder how that got quote unquote leaked. Exactly, exactly. All right, we're we're going to be going to our first break. We're going to come back with our industrial vacuum expert, and we're going to go over everything that is vacuums and why it just doesn't work with space and everything that's ridiculous about it. So stay tuned. We'll be back in three minutes. Provided I don't crash the whole system. Initiating the truth frequency. This is Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. It is subject matter night, but we are going to take calls in the third segment. So if you guys want to call in, that number is 720-897-6111, 720-897-6111, or 213-233-3998. That's 213-233-3998. If you're in the UK, it's 44203-393-2871. These are all on the Truth Frequency Radio website. And if you want to call in and not talk to me and just kind of hang out and listen on your phone, that number is 641-793-7117. We have subject matter expert, industrial vacuum, well, industrial vacuum expert, actually, Jerry. Jerry, are you still there? Yes, sir. Cool. Let's get right into it. So. Talk to me about vacuums because you know, and, and you know, the, the general, uh, the, the reason why this is kind of important is that lots of people in the flat earth community, and you heard this, have said that, wait, okay, where's the bleeding edge of space? Where does the edge of the atmosphere stop and the amazing power of the vacuum of space begin? And nobody can really define this. And what we're hoping that you can really do is clarify what the levels of of vacuum are and what they're measured in and the power of them. So what do you got? What, what, what made, what led you down this path when in your professional career, what, what resonated with you when it came to flat earth and vacuums? Uh, First of all, I stayed, started taking a critical look at the, ISS and the lunar module both. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and trying to see what systems they had in place for those for for the vacuum environment Mm -hmm. and uh as i've been inspecting things i mean like the most popular one is uh definitely that floppy door on the iss yeah i can't help but i gotta believe there's gotta be a stronger i keep wanting to believe there's a stronger door on that i mean that's just absolutely ludicrous i mean in the vacuum world you get laughed out if you walked into the into the fab with with something to seal a chamber up with that that's just I mean, I'm sure it's a secondary door too, yeah, you know. Yeah. But but point is, why is it there at all? Uh, it, there's no need for it. No, <laughs> there's no because there's no window on the door. No. So, so what, what's the point of it? Right. If you have a primary hatch, why do you need that thing? It's I I can't understand. It, it's like a it's like a door cozy. That's really I all know. it is. I know. Exactly. So. Uh, I just kind of want to get into like so people understand what vacuum is. And and to give you a bearing, to give the people a bearing of just how radically strong the vacuum in, in space is supposed to be. Like, I, I'm more familiar with Tor because that's what we worked with. And just to give you a little bit more background about me, I was the guy that actually repaired the valves and maintained the valves and the vacuum chambers and worked through the computer systems that controlled them. Mm-hmm. So I have an I have a pretty clear understanding of how vacuum works, mm-hmm. but the atmosphere that you and I stand in is 760 tor. Okay. Have you ever taken a vacuum and like just put it on your arm and flip the thing on and watch what happens to your skin? Yes, I have. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all done that, right? I think we've all done that. Yeah. <laughs> well. That measures at about 600 tor. Okay. So the and smaller that, the number, the higher the vacuum, okay? Okay, so smaller is better, and tor is that T-O-R-R? T-O-R-R. Okay, power of a yeah. vacuum is measured in tor, probably named after somebody named tor. Yes, it is, actually. Perfect, and, all right. Uh, so, and we've all seen these tests. I'm assuming a great many of us have seen the test on YouTube where people throw marshmallow in a little, you know glass chamber and they'll vacuum it out well these little pumps um they're just a rough low vacuum pump these are nothing even remotely near what the vacuum of space is supposed to be so you've got basically four five different categories of vacuum and one of them's rough or low vacuum and that goes down to one tour and then you've got a medium vacuum which goes from one tour to 10 to the minus 3 Tor. Oh, so you can actually go into negative numbers with Tor. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's like, so it's no different than like negative, uh, below freezing. Exactly, Got exactly. It. And okay. so people go, oh, I'm in a perfect vacuum. And it's like, no. In reality, perfect vacuum's not possible. Because it. that it all has to do with the relative amount of atoms within that given space that, that determines the level of vacuum. Okay. So then you have high vacuum, which is 10 to the negative 3 tor to 10 to the negative 7 tor. And then there's ultra high vacuum, which is where I was in, 10 mm-hmm. to the negative 7 tor t- to 10 to the negative 11 tor. Wow. Okay. okay. And then there's an extreme high, which is negative 11 on down. Okay. So now... You want to guess what the vacuum is purported to be at the space station? At the ISS? Yes. Um, it, I would imagine to be in the negative range. Yes. So negative five? Negative no. seven. Negative seven. Oh, I wasn't too far off. Okay. So ultra high. Yeah, it's in the negative high. Okay. Ironically, I, I did do some research today to see, and I actually found a NASA a NASA spec for their developing of uh, their gaskets and their O-rings for their doors. And they were only specking to negative eight, which is interesting because when you engineer anything, you always over-engineer it. You always add an extra area of safety in there, which I thought was kind of funny that they didn't do that. I mean, you do that amplifiers or anything you build. 
so the hatches on the ISS, which apparently they never close ever uh, for, for filming reasons, are only rated at negative eight Tor. According to the, the document that I saw and okay. that I read on the NASA. All right. So I'm just going to preface it with that. Okay. So, um, so now I don't know if you remember, but back in about 1960, before the supposed moon landing, there was a gentleman named Jim LeBlanc. And he actually had a spacesuit failure in a vacuum tested chamber. Okay. Very interesting results. Um, we know everything boils much lower at much lower temperatures um, under vacuum. Right. Well, he had a small leak in his suit and uh, he fell backwards. He could feel the saliva on his tongue boiling uh -oh. and then blacked out. And they instant, I mean, this happened like really quick. And this wasn't anywhere near the level of vacuum that they were in space. Wow. And uh, they repressurized the chamber fairly fast, which surprises me because you usually would get bends, just like scuba divers, from right. repressurizing that fast. Wow. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Huh. Anyway, so, okay. that's, so now if you can imagine that if you were in space and you got a leak, you'd be in a hell of a lot of trouble. I mean, it, instantly, you cannot, yeah. instant, it wouldn't be no 45 seconds like they try and tell you. It would be instant. <laughs> You'd be dead before you could. Bat right. Your eyes. Beca because the, the vacuum would start, would basically lower the boiling temperature of your bodily fluids to the point where yes. you would be boiling. You know, you, you'd be basically boiling at 98.6. And <laughs> yes. And the more vacuum you get that there is a, uh, there is a line that you can, there's a graph that you can plot that actually shows the boiling point just keep going down, clear down to, to freezing, mm -hmm. to like 32F. Oof. That's right. pretty crazy. That is crazy. So, anyway. Okay. Um, so, now, like, I worked in the uh, semiconductor industry. We did um, government contracts. We did gallium arsenide wafers, which are high-speed stuff that you can't get from like Intel because they're using silicone silicone substrate where we we're using gallium arsenide, which allowed us to have our tolerances much tighter and do higher frequency stuff. Um, so anyway, when we would pump down those chambers, an interesting thing I, I started to put together after being in the flat earth was we used three, three different pumps mm -hmm. on a system. Okay. Um, so you would first start out with a roughing pump that would get it down to about one tour, you know, somewhere around there. And then we'd step over to like a, a turbo pump, which would then kick on. And uh, that would get it down to like, you could get it down to like negative seven tour on that. Okay. And then you would have to swap over to what they call a cryo pump. And there are turbo pumps that will pump down deeper, but they get exponentially larger and heavier and just sure. ridiculous. Um, so then you actually have to switch over to a cryo pump or a cryogenic pump, which basically is a frozen carbon filter. And what happens is that the remaining particles in that chamber bounce around and they get lodged into that carbon filter and actually bring the vacuum to a lower point. The gotcha. reason they have to do that, Mark, is because the mechanical methods are no longer any good. There, there so, isn't enough horsepower in the world to suck out no, what you need out of that. No, not at all. So they have to go to that. And um, basically, that's what they call a viscous flow when it's down at the lower levels of roughing pump. Okay. And then there's a, there's a uh, Knudsen flow, and then it gets to the molecular flow. And so those are the reasons for the different... Um, for the different stages of pumping and interestingly enough like if you ask if you were to accidentally open one valve when it wasn't time like let's say for instance the turbo pump they mm -hmm. weighed anywhere from eight to nine hundred pounds for oh. one turbo pump and this is now mind you this is for like a two three cubic foot max internal air volume that you were trying to vacuum right 
And these things would spin super high revolutions. And if you accidentally opened that up too early while that thing was spinning, yeah, it would rip it to shreds. You would hear the loudest bang you ever heard. It's just insane, right? Wow. So anyway, with the uh, with these pumps, the reason why I'm going into this is because you you see them like for instance, they're trying to tell us they use parachutes to land the curiosity rover on Mars. Mm-hmm. Well, you're in a vacuum. How the heck is it slowing that thing down with a parachute? It's not possible. How are they pushing off against anything with with blasters or jets or anything? There's there's no atmosphere there to push off of. Period. Sure. End of statement. Right. So, I mean, that right there is enough proof for me. Um, but I would agree. Well, things- let me let me ask you a quick question. If one, you're stating that it is extremely hard. We cannot even create an absolute vacuum down here on the ground, no matter what technology we're using. For no. One. And two, it just all of a sudden occurred to me that the um, – because, you know, we're, we're talking about submarines. You know, they're in a pressurized environment, but, you know, yeah. it's the atmosphere trying to go the other way. With But the thing is, that's a that's a very, very, very heavy steel, envi- you know, environment there. <laughs> Whereas you're talking about the space station, which is super light, you know, very flexible metal. So how is that counteracting the, uh, the, the massive power of the vacuum outside of it? Yeah, because it's basically the same situation as, as deep sea, only in the inverse. The, yeah. vessel, the pressure is going to push it outwards instead of the atmosphere pushing it inward, the insides pushing it outward. So it's the same, it's just the inverse scenario. Wow. So it's every bit as, as strong. Wow. And the, and the other people jumping out of those and, and going around in their pressurized suit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. They're yeah. keeping their butt inside that vessel. And another thing that I noticed uh, as I'm looking, I, I tried to spend a bit of time today mm-hmm. and uh, look around at the space station. And uh, I saw so many holes <laughs> today, I was just flabbergasted um in an airplane they have i don't know a lot about it airplanes but i know they have redundant systems yeah of course now how much more would you need a redundant system in space than you would in an airplane oh yeah you need them and and we're talking military the military always builds in massive redundant systems yeah yeah comes to that it's exponentially more important also which was which I thought was interesting, and we talked about this when the industrial valve expert called in two years ago now. Hard to believe time flies. Where he was saying that look, when it comes to the tolerances, where you when you're building the the hatches, when you're when you're specking out the hatches on those ISS, you need a machine shop on board because every Navy ship has a full blown machine shop on board so that they can make just about any part they need. And he goes, here's the thing. Machine shops use a ton of power. They're extremely smoky. They generate you know, all sorts of waste. And the other thing is, he goes, they're really, really heavy. The, the, the machines you're using in a machine shop are tons and tons of solid metal. And he goes, where is this? Where, where is this thing on the ISS? How are they getting the, the, the parts? How are they getting everything? Because you were talking to me the other day and saying that the tolerances – are uh, are extremely uh, fine and the, that you, it's no joke you can't just mail it up there you just can't wrap it in brown paper and shoot it up to that thing if it's there right and if you look at the way they claim they're generating their oxygen is basically they're using electrolysis in water okay now let's think about this they've got to store the water for this first of all second of all if you don't use a saline or i mean a salt uh, or a potassium base to that water, it's going to take a lot longer to generate that oxygen. Number yeah. one. Number two, where are they storing all that water when they say they're so shy on water up there to begin with so much that they got to recycle their toilet pee and drink that. Right. Okay. Right. And then, and then the process basically uh, separates the hydrogen from the oxygen and uh, they say that they're releasing the hydrogen into space and pressurizing 
the oxygen into a container. That's as per NASA. Uh, is, and so, you think you think they'd want to show off that system? You oh th- no! Yeah, and you know where it is. <laughs> this is a funny part. It's like right by the the cupola, which we'll get into in a minute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's a small section. It reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah. It's like, we'll just make a door and we'll write Oxygen Supply Center. <laughs> you know, that's basically what they did. You can't see what's inside there. It's basically a black box. Right. You can't see what's behind there. And it's only like, from what I can gather, maybe five foot by five foot being generous. You know, as far as what I can see, who knows how deep it goes, but it's not that big. And, and yeah. so how are they generating enough oxygen for everyone to breathe based off that little space? And then also, every time they open that space hatch, the way they're decompressing it, according to what my research has shown me, mm-hmm. is they're throwing it through a vent with a muffler on it to silence the sound. Right. And uh, they're outgassing it out into space. So now you've lost all that oxygen that right. was in there, right? Right. And you've got this system that's only generating oxygen, not nitrogen, because we know in the atmosphere we've got 78% nitrogen, uh, nitrogen, yeah. and we're 21% oxygen with, like, the rest being argon and carbon. You're, like, at 0.9% argon and 0.03 on carbon. Mm-hmm. So where where are they getting this nitrogen? So that would facilitate the ne- or create the necessity to have a nitrogen tank in there right. because they must have hydro they must have nitrogen in there because they also before their spacewalk are said to breathe only pure oxygen in that chamber so if you're following their whole narrative that means there's got to be nitrogen in there somewhere being supplied but on that whole video i don't see any room for tanks right Right, yeah, and, and you're, no, you're absolutely right, and the average person doesn't realize that we're breathing, we'll just round it up to 80, four parts nitrogen and one part oxygen, so mm-hmm. where the heck are you getting the nitrogen from, because yeah. if you're if you're breaking down water, you're only getting hydrogen and oxygen, so, yeah. and well, and honestly, in a pure yeah. oxygen environment, as you know, is is really tricky, because one, it's very, very flammable. Actually, it's not. In and of itself, it's not flammable. Okay. Hydro- hydrogen is, but oxygen itself will not ignite. It's well, okay, no, it won't ignite. But if but if you but if you have a flame, but oxygen. you don't want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was saying it'll ox it'll um, oxidize things and help them to burn much more rapidly. Exactly. Which, it's, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not. No, I'm not saying it's like hydrogen where it's explosive. Yeah. Where yeah. you can just you know touch a match to it. But ox- the pure oxygen environment is no joke either. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so, but you got a great point. Where the heck is the nitrogen coming from? In fact, I don't even yeah. know until you had mentioned it. I don't even know how you make nitrogen if you had to, uh, if you had to s- synthesize it. I haven't had time to look that one up yet. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Somebody look that up. How in the heck would you yeah. add nitrogen? Cause you'd want to do that. You know, to, I mean, yeah, I know, I know they'd have supply tanks of it, but I right. just don't know how, how it's made. Mm. So, that's really, so really that- interesting. So now let me tell you about this other thing, the valves, right? I'm just going to cap on those because I used to rebuild them. Okay. And uh, I'm here to tell you there's no valve that's going to last a year without being repaired. And there's got to be a whole lot of valves in that place. I mean a lot. But I don't see one single visible valve in there. Not one. I don't see it on the inside and I don't see it on the outside. Right. Right. So where so, are they? <laughs> yeah, where are they? And, you know, I listened to the other vacuum show because I didn't want to hit the exact same points. Oh, no, that. no, that's fine. That's fine. So, so yeah, you've got pneumatic, right? Mm-hmm. You've got hydraulic, but you've also got you know, the linear actuator, the motorized electric motor version. And then they also have a manual one that you can physically move as well. So definitely it's either going to be a nano electric type actuator or a manual one but either way you're going to want redundancy in that because if that valve takes a dump you're screwed yeah yeah <laughs> you are yeah, screwed. And, you're yeah, not just... you... 
Yeah, and you never see anyone even trying to repair or maintain these valves, ever. Oh, not at once. And you have to replace the seals on them. You got to, like, you'll have to reabraze them sometimes. And there's usually, like, a U channel that the, that the seal goes in, and then, in the, or the O ring that it would go in, and then that meshes up. Well, there's sliding mechanism, mechanisms and bolts and screws, and those bolts and screws do strip out. They do strip out, and they need to be repaired. The seals need to be repaired. you got to have grease there. I don't see tool sets anywhere around there yep. to service that either. So I don't see the valves. I don't see the tool sets. I don't see O-rings. They never show you any of that. And then the way they explain most of their technology on the ISS is always they just say, oh, here's like, for instance, the oxygen thing. Oh, we just use our electrolysis, blah, 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 and here's how you get the oxygen, and we outgas the thing. But they don't go into any more detail beyond that. No. They, it's, it's just more, hey, trust us, it works, we're it's, massive. It's just a machine that's behind the door. Exactly. <laughs> With the sticker it on it. It's, it's, oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. So l- let me let me ask you this, and, and I know you got other things I want to cover. I want to ask you this before the break because I want this statement from you. In your opinion, is there any way – in your professional opinion, is there any way that the ISS can function as advertised by NASA? No way. <laughs> no way. There's nothing no even remotely way. true about anything they're saying up well, there. Well, I mean, there are systems that would definitely work, but wait till we get into the cupola. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so go on. We got we got uh, three minutes, to, actually two and a half minutes before the break. I, I can cover the cupola in that time. Okay. What do you got? Okay, there's seven windows in the cupola. I think most of us have probably seen the video of the shutters, which I think looks uh, highly suspect the way they move. It's supposed to be mechanical, and she's turning it really slow, and it's moving on its own whether she turns it or not. So it's not like a very linear system in its movement with turning the handle. But anyway... They went back and researched the guy that actually designed it, who now owns a shop that builds something completely different. But he um, he said, basically, the only thing that seals off all seven windows, all seven turnkeys that open and close that, which is directly connected to the outside at a negative eight tour, mm-hmm. is two tiny little O-rings. Now, mind you, You've got to be able to service this thing. And it's been up there for, what, almost 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. And these are moving part O-rings. These things would need to be replaced all the time. I, I, and I, I could throw out a number, but it would be a guesstimate. But probably every two to three weeks, if you're opening and closing it a lot. Two to and three weeks? <laughs> depending, depending on how much they opened and closed it. Wow. And that's that's to that's even considering those tiny little O rings would hold up to that high of vacuum, which I'm telling you, there's no way you're going to have an O ring that is dynamic that's going to hold at that vacuum. You have to compress that O ring pretty solid to keep it from losing vacuum. Wow, incredible! There is or losing pressure in the cupola. There's no way. No way. And then there's seven windows, and you're telling me that out of 14 O-rings, none of them have ever failed in 20 years. Right. Yeah. Good. Excellent. All right. Hold that thought because we're going to go to the break, and we're going to come back with industrial vacuum expert Jerry. And I didn't ask you, where are you calling from, Jerry? St. George, Utah. St. George, Utah. Perfect. Three minutes. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. You might miss them. Truth Frequency Radio. You must unite what has been set aside. We are TFR. Radio. Major Kong. Major Kong. I'm ready to target the ICBM complex at Laputa. Switch it up. 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 Switch it
Welcome back to Strange World, part three of four. Special thanks to Chip Baker for that soundtrack. And I've got to lead with a quick homage to the ghost of David Cassidy. I was kind of joking around with the peanut gallery earlier. May have made an off-taste joke. And because of that, the show crashed and burned for the three four minutes and we peanut gallery and i joke about that all the time it's like you don't you don't make fun of people that recently died because you know mm. they come come back to bite you <laughs> i think it did i mean literally he's going nope it's gonna get you it's going to use not and next thing you know dead air it's like fantastic super great uh on another note don't forget that tomorrow I will be on Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, The Secret Show, Patricia Steer's 200th episode, Wednesday, it's tomorrow, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. There's literally going to be 10,000 cameos, including potentially the ghost of David Cassidy. See, he's probably going to go after the system now, but it was, that, was, that was all, that was tongue-in-cheek. Don't kill me, David. Anyway, we're on with subject matter expert Jerry from Utah. We're talking about industrial vacuums, and we left off with the ISS being a physical impossibility <laughs> because yeah. all the things they advertise up there, there's way too many moving parts, way too many high pressure systems for this thing to be a reality. Yes, you believe that is true, right? That that the ISS is a piece of junk. There's no way it can do what it's it's they say it can do. No, no. Cool. Please. Where do you want to go from here? Like well, like when I was at the fab and I was doing um, maintenance repair work, we had a team literally 24-7. We never closed down. And we all had our own tool sets that we were assigned to. And uh, it was because those things are very temper. They're very, uh, uh, what do you finicky? want to call it? They're finicky, yeah. Oh. They're very finicky. Yeah. And uh, so you, you've you got to be ready to fix those things quick, especially up there if something's going to go wrong. Right. And uh, Yeah, yeah. So well, it, uh, I mean, if you, like, for example, let's say you were hired to go up there like Bruce Willis in Armageddon <laughs> yeah. and to, to be a, a, a machine shop guy up there, right? I can't even imagine what you would have to bring with you just so you'd feel somewhat competent to do what you needed to be done. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And the funny part is, is it's like they just keep inventing stuff to do things, right? Oh, right. you got to go to the bathroom. Oh, well, we got a thing that turns the stuff into this and that. And it's just a brush over how it does it. They never get into the real science of how it works right. uh, most of the time. But you start, I, I, I started looking at those solar panels today. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, how big are they? And then I started, well, how much does it take just to power one pump? And then I'm thinking, okay, you got the pump, you got the electrolysis, you got the lights, you got the, you know, you got the oxygen. It's, there's so many things to power up. Right. I just and, can't even fathom the the load on the electricity. Oh my god! And and the daily maintenance. You know what always bothered me, and it's bothered several people that have looked at the ISS. When do you see an astronaut with a freaking wrench, or any tool for that matter? <laughs> They should be working. There should be dedicated guys up there working on things, like you said, all the time. There should be a maintenance sheet. In fact, any Navy guy will tell you this. On a Navy ship, you're always working on stuff. Always, always, always. And yet, the only thing you see is these guys floating around in their khakis and their polo shirts and their socks. Yeah. Not a it's care in the world. You know, it, it drives me insane, not to mention the little thing like uh, somebody mentioned. It's like, look, you get a micrometeor, again, if you believe in space, the size of a nickel that punches into that, you're doomed. You could say, oh, what, yeah. you, you could say what you want about patching something, but if it's negative, whatever, let's say it's negative nine tor outside that space station, 
that's it. It is over. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. And then I'm the job I'm doing right now, ironically, I'm actually uh we're working on some I can't disclose what, but we're working on something for solar panels and we actually test those solar panels. And let me tell you, those things are fragile. Oh, I mean uh, really fragile. So <laughs> they, so even though they, even the they, tiniest they, space they, rock and that's and they're Oh yeah. Yeah, I if you dropped your cell phone on them, they'd break. Wow, but that is I'm bad. sure I'm sure they put a I'm sure they put a some kind of a coating or not coating. Oh, sure. But still, they're very sensitive. Any banging around, uh, those things would be history. Yeah, you know we don't even have. Uh, let's let's pick on ISS a little bit more. I'm I'm going to pretend I'm Jaron tonight because Jaron <laughs> loves tearing apart NASA. And that is, we don't even have a rough cut time lapse of the assembly of the space station. <laughs> no, and, and can you? Okay, let's let's go into seals again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on that level, you have to be so absurdly clean when you're when you're sealing up that high of a vacuum level. It's not even funny. Yeah. Um, just to give you an idea, if you if you have your stupid finger print left inside like a chamber it'll come as uh what they call a, a virtual leak because the outgassing from the oils on that print introduces more atoms into that chamber and you will see it not be able to pump down all because of a stupid little fingerprint wow um it, it's insane but if you have like a little tiny hair or or a little tiny speck of dust on the o-ring Mm -hmm. And you think it's clean, we've wiped it down with IPA, isopropanol, yeah. and we put it in there with the vacuum grease and, and sealed it up, and then you go to pump it down, and then all of a sudden you're like, it's not pumping down. You take it back apart, you know, and this was in a clean room. You've right. got the full bunny suit on, gloves, you know, hair net, glasses, mouth guard, the whole nine, and you still can't be clean enough. <laughs> it, it's insane. <laughs> and you sometimes you have to, and you've got to replace those O rings constantly. We have a healthy supply of those O rings around because they constantly need to be changed. Yeah, yeah, I I, I know. And and the industrial valve guy that I talked to two years ago said in his statement the same thing, which was uh, there's there's so much maintenance the and the tolerances the when <laughs> you're the the O rings and and when you're fitting the doors the tolerances are so extreme that there is no margin for error ever to where you're constantly uh, machining new parts, constantly adjusting seals. And we never, ever see that ever. Uh, just, well, heck let's go the opposite direction. We never even see him close a freaking hatch. Oh, I mean, no. in the military oh. submarines, and we've all seen it in the movies and documentaries, you walk through one section, you close the door behind you and you go to the next section because if there's a leak, you don't want the whole submarine to go down. The ISS apparently is the opposite of that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where they need, but I get it, because if you're going to do filming and you want to make sure there's as much un uninterrupted footage as possible, you need these guys floating through multiple sections. And that gives the illusion that everything's great and everything's cool and we can just ship, ship things up there. Y instead of shipping O-ring parts, because every piece would be so meticulous and every piece would be... Um, padded so much and weigh so much and yet they're being sent guitars flutes gorilla suits, gorilla suits yeah. every nfl jersey apparently from every team because it was done before the playoffs even started uh i mean and the, oh it's just it's just mind-blowing okay anyway <laughs> what else what else you want to throw in there before eventually i'm hoping we can take a few calls tonight what else yeah. what else you got for me um anything fun let's see uh I got a bag a little bit. I don't like bagging, but some people are just too easy. <laughs> <laughs> that, what do you want to go after? That that, that Don Petit. Okay. What is his marketing? <laughs> what, it's like he sounds like he's talking to kindergartners every time he talks. Right. It's like we're slow class or something. Right. The, the, <laughs> the man that said we lost the technology to go back to the moon. That exactly. Guy? Yeah. 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 He just drives me nuts. Listening yeah, to I, I'm I'm honestly embarrassed every time he gets on. It's like that's the guy. That's your press secretary. That's <laughs> who you want out in front of the cameras. 
because <laughs> the way he's explaining it is not very. I mean, I know he seems sort of convinced. You know, he's just reading. He's reading what they told him to, and he's like, he. I. I have no doubt he believes it, but it, it's so. It sounds so hollow from him. Right. It's like, oh yeah, we just don't have the. You know, he kind of sound. Who he sounds like? He sounds like Marty McFly's dad in <laughs> Back to the Future. In in the first one, that's if you put Marty McFly's dad, McFly, you put him in front of the camera. That's what he kind of sounds like. He'd probably be better than. He'd him. probably be better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, oh my god, it's horrible. Who else you want to go after? Anybody? I want to talk a little bit more about the O rings. Okay. Um, because there are many different kinds, and and they make them, they manufacture them according to what you need. There's a permeability rating on them that uh, that will change according to the temperature that they're they're placed in, and the pressure that they're actually compressed will change as well. And uh, basically, you've got like a nitrile of uh, viton, uh, EPDM, silicone, neoprene, mm-hmm. hydronated, and then there's uh, a PTFE, and the one that has the greatest range, like from hot to cold, yeah. is um, is good from negative 300 Fahrenheit to uh, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So that's, that's quite a range. That's a really high, none of the other ones are even remotely close. That's okay. definitely the the best one out of the lot for that type of uh, O ring. Yeah. Um, but still, that's well. <laughs> under the range that we're supposed to be in the thermosphere. <laughs> Good point. And then there, they, so most people are familiar with the, with the standard, you know, nitrile or rubberish silicone or mm-hmm. neoprene O-rings, right? Right. Well, they actually have, when you get into ultra, like extreme high mm-hmm. vacuum, yeah. you want to guess what the vacuum on the moon is? Uh, negative science. are we talking about tor measurements yeah. in tor now uh negative 10 negative 11 ah close yeah you good guess mm-hmm. so anyway they go into a different when you get into that high mm-hmm. those other types start to become no good because the permeability of them right they just won't handle it so what they actually have to do is go to soft metals Right. So they'll use like a copper, they'll use a copper ring. Yeah. And uh, the way it works, and they also use silver. Interestingly enough, the copper melts at 1984 Fahrenheit. Right. Silver melts at 1763. Okay. So the thing about these type of, uh, of O-rings or gaskets mm-hmm. are they're a one-use time. You can't reuse That's it. it. One and done. Throw- Yes, melt it down, make another one. Oh, wow. So so the way they work is there's a channel and a knife. So the knife, you place the O-ring over that channel, and then the knife portion, which would be like on the lid, would press down into that, and that would create your seal. Um, with the soft metals, it, it does better. But in order for those to work, the metal that it's, connecting you know like on the door and the base Mm -hmm. those actually have to be highly polished and that's how fine it has to be to contain that sort of a vacuum i mean it's insane that's amazing you know that kind of reminds me of when you were you were saying you have to abandon one material for another most people know that your your average lamborghini all the normal cars use rubber wheels but when you get up to like rocket cars like the the cars that break the speed of sound you yeah. rub there is no rubber made that can handle those speeds because the centrifugal force just shreds oh, them oh, so art, yeah yeah they have to switch to ceramic wheels if you're wondering what those are it's basically rock you basically yeah. having wheels made out of rock and hope to God your shock absorbers <laughs> handle yeah. it. Yeah. And you're basically talking Flintstone wheels uh, because yeah. that that way at least you know that they're not going to tear apart at the at the high RPMs. So, hey, um, there's a good way to a good way to think about the ISS because I mean the pressure in the ISS compared to the atmospheric pressure around it mm-hmm. is like well, many times greater than. What a tire is, but have you ever seen a tire blow? <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. 
insane. What were you going to say? Oh, no, I was going to say, uh, would you mind if we took a couple calls before? Because we got about 10 minutes or so till the last break. Uh, yeah. are you, oh, are you do it. Okay, let's take a few calls. I do not know what they're going to ask, but if I don't do this now, I'm going to catch some some hell. And let's start with, oh, let's do Dallas, Te- oh, and Dallas, Texas just dropped off the line. Uh, Beverly Hills, I see you. I am not going to grab you right this second. Let's pick up Washington, D.C. Wow, a lot of fun calls. Uh, Washington, D.C. Here we go. 202 area code. You're on with Strange World and Industrial Vacuum Expert. What's going on? Hi, Mark. This is Tippy Long stalking on the plane. Hi. How oh, are you? I am good. How are you? I'm very good. You know what? The conversation is very technical right now, but <laughs> yes. I just want to cut it short. You you just you just wanted to what? Okay. I want to cut it short. Okay. Let's talk about the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> The Big Bang Theory, that's that's what you want to transition to right now, the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, so we talk about the ISS and the valves and the whoop and the what, the what, what whatever. <laughs> right, right. How can, how can something come from nothing? I agree. I absolutely agree. There's an old, old saying which how you throw it, that you throw it, you know, I, from nothing. I agree. Ask any scientist. You say, hey... I, I understand the Big Bang that you're trying to tell me, but what happened before the Big Bang? And that's where it all falls apart. They they can't tell you. It's like, well, and you know, what caused it? Well, we don't know, but it but it caused itself. You know, yeah. I, I, because I, it know, I appreciate. Go ahead. I, I appreciate the, you know the gentleman the, the discussing the valves and the law, the, the the pipes and whatever. Right, yeah, right. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But I want to go back further. I want to go back further. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you what. Nothing. Is a break coming on, Mark? No, no, no. It's not, it's, not, it's not coming on. I'll tell you what I'll do. As far as the Big Bang okay. goes, what I will try to do, I will do, I will try to do a special show on the universe at large and, and the creation of the universe. I, I promise. I absolutely, okay. I absolutely will do that. Unfortunately, I can't. I can't. And I, and I love your question because it is a great question that's tied to flat Earth. Which is, if flat Earth is real, then it, what happens to evolution? What happens to the Big Bang? And what caused the Big Bang? But we will, we will save that for a, a, a show soon. But I appreciate you asking. I do. Thank you. And I'm the one who got up in the middle of the night. And walked into the kitchen and saw my parents or heard my parents talking about, well, you know, she's adopted. (laughs) (laughs) I'm adopted, too. And that's how I got into Flat Earth in 2015. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. All right. I'm the only one from Washington, D.C. I'm in I'm in D.C. All right. And no, I haven't had no meetup or nothing in D.C. Would you like a meetup? Would you'd like a meetup? All right, tell you what, anyone out in DC in the DC area, if you want to do a meetup, just email me the restaurant or wherever you want to go to bar. I don't care, and I will make a I will make a promo for you. Oh, a bar is nice. Please, <laughs> I will. I promise. I I did it to LA, and then all of a sudden LA is full of that stuff now. So hopefully we can. Thank you, Mark. We're out there. All right. Any any shout outs before I let you go? Have you had a good night's sleep yet? Uh yes, I have gotten I've finally caught up my sleep since the conference. Yes, thank you. God bless you, Mike. All right. I will talk to you soon, okay? Shona. <laughs> Keep Bye. it flat. I'll see you. Keep it flat, boo. All right. <laughs> okay, let's pick up New York. Uh, 845 area code. You're probably going to be the last call before the break. Well, we'll see. Maybe. What uh, What's going on? Hey. Hey, how are you? It's Mark from New York. How are hey, you? Hey, it's Mark from New York, the guy that makes me look bad. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. You're the man. Uh, you should, and, you're the uh, one that Jerry, should Jerry, you're pretty freaking awesome. 
Well, you should have gone into radio, but I know you're doing a great job doing the firefighting thing. So, you know, that's respectable. Yeah, I, I got I got a face for radio, no doubt. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's, what's on your mind? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I just wanted to say I am loving this conversation okay. because you're, you're just hitting on those physical things that people cannot dispute. Right. Oh my God. It's so frustrating. Cause finally, I mean, not finally, I mean, but you're, you're presenting it in such a good way. I, I'm loving this. I'm loving I'm it. Glad. I'm glad. I, 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 go ahead. I, I'll go ahead. No, I was just going to ask if you could t- talk a little bit more about the cupola stuff, because I've always looked at that and wondered how in the hell does that stay sealed? You know, with a crank that goes outside. <laughs> hmm. I got you. So yeah, so it's like an uh, like a little hatch on a submarine, but yet it's in space. So how exactly does that work? Uh, Jerry, would you like to chime in at all? You want to reiterate uh, anything? Yeah. Basically, what happens is those O rings, in theory, roll as it's turning. <coughs> well, anytime you move anything on something else, you've got friction. So first and foremost, right. it would need to be lubricated c- constantly. Uh, second of all, that pressure on those O-rings would not be a loose connection. It would have to be fairly tight, probably extremely tight. When I would um, close up a chamber, um, for instance, we had one tool, you'd have to go down and you'd have a torque, uh, torque spec for that. And you would have to do it much like you do a car tire. You do the star pattern so that it all lays down evenly so that there's not a, right. an uneven surface. And so those things have to be adhered to or it's not going to seal up right. So to have something rolling at that high of a level is just ridiculous. There's no way in space that would work under that vacuum. But it would work in an, in an underwater right. training facility. Exactly. (laughs) Correct. It works in the pool. It does work in the pool. It would work if James Cameron was directing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Or Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Yeah, if he was directing it. Whoever whoever's shooting this thing in the water. Sorry. I keep thinking when I when I keep watching the the scenes of the ISS because I know NASA steals from every well everybody steals from everybody else but I keep thinking (laughs) of the 1989 movie The Abyss where James Cameron had to invent an underwater scene where he took these giant swimming pools, but they were outdoors so they could lower stuff in and really easily. And they uh, filled the top of the pool with layers and layers of tiny black rubber balls to where it blocked out all light. And when he did that, it was amazing because not only could you simulate underwater situations, but given the right lighting, you could also simulate space. So... I thought it was really, really. Right. Hey, I'm um, sorry. Quote for you, real quick, uh, Mark. Before I forget, this yep. is from the Peanut Gallery. One for you. Actually, okay. I have one for you, Jerry. All right. All right. The quote is: "The Go obscure, ahead. the obscure we see eventually, the completely obvious it seems takes longer." That's from Edward R. Murrow. So, what do you got? Nice. I got fantasy flows. In where vacuum or fact leaves a vacuum. <laughs> you actually looked up vacuum quotes. Fantasy. Of course I did. Come on, of course I did. Nice. And that was by Tom Stoppard. I don't know who he is. Huh. Good. I wonder if these people actually but, know anything. Yeah, I, of course I had to find you a vacuum quote. Come on. Thank you. That's I'm awesome. loving this. I really am. And, and, and I'll get off. I know you got other callers, but yeah. I just want to throw one more thing out there. If you could touch on the spacesuits themselves. Why don't these guys look like the Michelin man when All they're right. out there? All right, Jerry. I was can, actually going to touch that topic. Can you, can you do it in two minutes before the break? Can you start it in two minutes before the break? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Go do it. Um, yeah. Uh, from what I've seen, I, I, don't know how you'd come up with the material that's stitched together, and let alone just be a material that's not aluminum that would hold up to that kind of vacuum. It, I've never personally had the one to see how it would perform, but I don't see in my mind how that would work. 
Um, wouldn't I mean if if the tour is that high, the that oh, it, it so would totally high. be the Stay Puff Marshmallow, and they uh, you know, and their argument is, oh, we pressurize the suit. Okay, so you're making it that much even greater because yeah. you're putting more pressure in there. So theoretically, that extra pressure should be pushing out on it even further because it's putting more force in the outward direction. No. Right. Okay. Yep, I, t- I totally believe it. Yeah, I, I, in I fact, awesome. I, wouldn't, awesome. wouldn't you have to treat it kind of like a deep diving suit where it's all metal, you know, in very, very small sections of moving parts? Yes. One of the, what was it, a gym, gym diving suit, that big metal yeah. one with the, with yeah, with the, the, the hooks rotating and, balls on I it? Mean, everything is super, yes. super heavy. Because, well, yeah, you're, I think you're right. Why? I, what stitched material out there, what soft material can counteract uh, a yeah. vacuum, can counteract a negative 9, negative 10 vacuum force? How, how is it, how's it? And then you look at all the seal points, the points for error. Oh yeah, seals. I mean, they've got they've got like four cuff lengths of of seals at different locations just in one arm alone. You know, you got the glove, you got the elbow, you got the the. There's like a center cap that connects the arm and the shoulder together, and then the helmet. It's like oh, there is, and then they kind of brush over the pants section and right. the shoe, so you don't quite see what's going on. It's we like are. They put flap over <laughs> things. We're, we're going to break right, right now. Go. We'll be back in three minutes, hey, guys. They must be using space. They must be using space Velcro. This is Truth Frequency Radio. No hate, no hype, no fear. Real people, real radio. I'm Mark Sargent, and this is Strange World, and that was Joe Jackson stepping out from his album, Night and Day. Uh, we got subject matter expert tonight, industrial vacuums to be more specific, uh, but first a couple of shameless plugs, check out EnclosedWorld.com, and if you're doing a meetup, there's a special new thing on EnclosedWorld.com where you can go to the forums and there's a folder for every state. So if you want to do a meetup in your state and you haven't done one yet, well, by all means, log in and say, hey, I want to do a meetup. And then, you know, you probably also want to email me if you want me to do the promo. But if you don't want me to do the promo, or you just want to do it yourself. Uh, just post in there. And it's not, you know, I'm not, it's not a flat earth meetup matchup thing, but it's something anyway. And also I'm going to be, remember, tomorrow at Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, a secret show. Episode 200. Can you believe it? It's gone by that fast. Since 2015, 200 episodes. Pretty amazing. And the peanut gallery is chiming in before I get back to my subject matter. 5 p.m. Central. No, I'm not going to say Central and Mount. No, no. For, nobody says those time zones anymore. They only say Pacific and Eastern. In fact, most your average American, and I've touched on this several times before because I used to work in the time and attendance industry, does not even know how many time zones there are in the country. Jerry, how many time zones are there? Quick, on the spot. Don't look it up. Four. I'll hear. There's four. Most people think there's three. And you know there are four. It's a little cheat, actually, because you know there's four because you're in the one that everyone forgets. Back, <laughs> back in the day, I don't know how old you are, but back in the day when they announced things, they'd say... Uh, you know, like nine Eastern, eight Central, and six Pacific, and that was it. So I, people say, "Oh, well, there's only three time zones." No, there's mountain time. The mountain out over here. Yeah, mountain time zone. You got Salt Lake City, you got Denver, and I think you got uh, something in Texas. <laughs> there's not a lot out there. <laughs> it's really not much. So anyway, uh, we are taking calls and we're talking to Jerry about stuff. Let's grab. Oh, for the love of God, let's pick up Beverly Hills. Here we go. <laughs> Beverly Hills, California. I know you've been waiting for a while. Yeah. I don't know if you're listening or you're smoking or whatever. <laughs> what's what's going on, guys? 
What, what's up, guys? <laughs> hey, uh, I actually, I actually had a question. This is Andy from Beverly Hills, of course. Hey, Andy. Um, is Ross with you? I had a question. Hey, yeah, yeah Ro- I'm right here. What's All that? right. What's All up, right. Mark? Just checking. Just checking. Yeah, I, I brought this up on the show before, and I just it's such it's such a weird thing. I can't seem to reconcile. What? Why, like where? Like you know how these guys are going up for six to eight months um, on the ISS apparently or whatever. Right. They're going up for like six and eight months at a time. Oh yeah. What the heck? Because they can't risk going out in public. They couldn't possibly risk going out in public during that time. Right. So where the hell are these guys going? Is that what they're doing with all our money? They're going like the Bahamas for like. Oh no, no 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 no! It's eight easier months. than that. Think about it, man. Okay, get a member. Everybody that's up there. I'm sorry. I'm saying it like it's a real thing. Everybody <laughs> that yeah. says they're going up there, they are members of the United States Air Force. Plain and simple. They are all military. So, and and they're under orders. You don't have to be nice with them. It's like, look, you're going to stay at one of our special Air Force bases, not necessarily Area 51 or anything like that, but in an Air Force base, you can, uh-huh. you're can you confined to these, this barrack area. You have access to the gym. You have access to computers and television and movies and all the and things you cafeteria, want. the cafeteria, right? And the caf. Well, <laughs> yeah, the cafeteria would be limited. You'd probably, I mean, but. And well, how the, about their families? Like, how about Gabby Giffords? Where is Gabby Giffords when Mr. Kelly is going up there and playing Well, around? you don't. Does she know where he is or not? No, you don't have to tell her. I mean, you could, I suppose, if you want. But remember, you don't. Compartmentalization says that you only. It's a need to know basis. So unless you can think of a good reason why Gabby should know, eh, let her believe the illusion. Why not have her? If I have her do the video calls, oh look, I'm floating in space and CGI and all that. Why not? Right. Uh, you, you just keep. But so the short. They have the ability to fake all that wherever he's being kept. They've got since they do some live stuff. That means that they must have the ability to fake something wherever they're keeping these guys. Yes. Their, yeah. 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 Their, it's well, in fact. So they're, they're in a that. live exercise. They're like living in a live exercise. You know? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. And you've seen that video where the guy flubs up and says, over here where we are, and they're right. on the East Coast. Right. Yes, yes. Put yeah, yeah. Be- beforehand, in fact, it's way easier to fake it now than it used to be. Beforehand, you could mix some CGI with some of the zero-G planes. But now they've figured out that they can do almost all CGI now. And it's and it's pretty good mm-hmm. stuff. It's not right. perfect, and I really don't think they should do live feeds where they're talking to school kids because it is not flawless. I know they. Wait, wait, I know you they, mean to where their their whole bodies are CGI. You're saying? Well, not their whole bodies, but their back the background around them. You know, it's it's Hollywood can do a lot of things, and we can do some decent live stuff, but it's not perfect. So yes, the short answer is yeah. You can fake quite well, a bit of this. Caught on that uh, many a time. They've been Sorry. caught on that many a times. You can see the, you know, the glitches. I really quick, have they ever actually has someone actually been out there when the, uh, you know, and followed like a spacecraft? Like I'm sure it has to la- or a spacecraft. It's funny how you know you get you program with these words, but I guess an airplane. <laughs> what are they flying up a glider or something? Does it come down? I mean, what is it? What landing? Like I don't know. It's what, in the ocean. That's why we can't get there. And what are we talking? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it, the ocean. It's, a, it's a quote a line from Mission you know Impossible. You when they shoot off. Oh, okay. We're just the regular rockets. I mean, when they're first. No, no. They're arcing over and dumping them into the ocean. In fact, look up a thing called uh, the Space Graveyard, which is every place that cool. even, even NASA will tell you. It's like, oh, yeah, our boosters we dump out into a very remote spot in the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean. And what we're saying is, no, you're so dumping. Hold on it. a second. Would that mean? Hold on. Would that mean that there's? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would that mean that when the, when you see the space shuttle attached to a freaking rocket, okay? Right. Everyone's in the flat Earth is saying that there's no one on that space shuttle right there that's attached vertically to that rocket. So right. They're not right. there, right? The shuttle in the, that means they're dumping the whole shuttle in the middle. Eh, of the you may no. You may I not have. Go ahead. Look, go ahead, Jerry. Has anyone seen this? They're doing is flying it to a remote location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you might remember we our remote capabilities are way oh, better. Oh, I see. Today. So you could you could remote. Remember, like like jet airplanes now. The plane the planes you fly on, they can fly remotely now. The only problem is is you won't be able to get anyone to board that plane because everybody wants a freaking pilot. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, it's, Skynet may right. be a real thing, but like even me, I'd be like pretty hesitant if there was nobody in the cockpit, even yeah. if they're not oh, doing yeah. it. So yeah. 
So you could you could land stuff. <laughs> you, you could land the shuttle somewhere if you wanted to save it. If you were trying to, you know, cut back a little bit on the funds, you don't have to. I suppose you could dump it if you wanted to. If it was just a hollow piece of crap, but you could also land it, it, it if you if you like wanted. Like someone to. touch it, man. right? Yeah. Or it seems I mean, like someone would have caught that on camera or something. Like uh, it, it land or, or, or it goes horizontal. They caught it. Like it goes horizontal. We know that. Right? Oh, yeah. I but mean, no, 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 no. Because it goes over the ocean. You know, eventually you're not going to be able to track it anymore. And NASA has gotten real sneaky yeah. uh, by, and you can look up DITRH's videos where they, once it go, once it starts going horizontal, they switch over to the computer generated, you know, this is what the, the, the rocket is doing. Cool. And it's obvious CGI, you know, it's blatantly horrible CGI. And they're just saying, okay, this is what's happening. It's like, okay, we're going to watch that. You know what? Can we all agree that there's never anyone attached? Can we all agree that there's oh. never anyone inside a shuttle when it's attached to one of those giant classic? Why? It looked the last. Thing, the last thing you would ever huh? want to do is put some person at the top of a pile of liquid explosives. <laughs> Something you right. don't do. <laughs> so, so, I mean, which is why <laughs> the Challenger turned out to be kind of a problem because <laughs> that that thing blew up and you had to do something you know. with the people. And it's like, okay, let's just relocate. Hey, right. right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I want to. I want to tell you something. My dad actually used to work for NASA. Really? And, uh, he was like, yeah. He he worked for NASA. He was like, he was really good at mathematics. So he got some like I don't know some kind of scholarship to, and he got like top secret clearance. Yeah. And he used to do the wires down in the bottom, and he said he used to watch, um, you know, the like down at the bottom of the spacecraft. He like put together these wires apparently oh, and cool. he was telling me like he would watch yeah really cool and but he, he what i thought was really interesting was that he said when you got up if you'd go up there but you know like where you could actually board this supposed aircraft you know yeah. spacecraft or whatever but he says there's a guy guarding a couple guys guarding it with a big shotgun he's just sitting there. <laughs> no one comes in or I bet. Yeah, no, straight up. Like, that's what my dad tells me. And he told me, and he saw it, like, blasting off from, like, one of those bunkers, because you can get into those bunkers. Yeah. And he had top secret clearance there. And he told me it, it, like, blew up. Like, when he left, he goes, someone must have not, like, plugged in one of those things. <laughs> like, you know, it's just kind of like, you never really could figure anything out, though, because I was really asking him about it. I'm like, you work there? I'm like, you know, like, I don't know. And he was showing me the SpaceX stuff that I thought was very interesting. Like, these, do you guys have you guys heard of uh, what uh, what what's his name Tesla was doing by uh, landing a refueling rocket? Uh, what, what was it? Uh, refueling? Uh, no, setting up a rocket or to a like a I guess it would somehow fly up to a satellite, give them something, refuel them, and then they would come back down without having to like get rid of the rocket. Oh uh, right, right, yeah, the reusable. Oh, well, the thing by Elon Musk's team, um, yeah, SpaceX, yeah. That's a bunch of crap, right? You guys it saw is a that. Bunch of it crap. just all of a sudden landed. I watched that, it. <laughs> that landing looks so damn fake. Oh, it was hard. Horrible. You saw that? It just shifted all of a sudden. It was landed, and of course, oh, we did it. It was yeah. the most, even my dad, I'm like, dad, what was that? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, man. I, I, I hate think it's just blatant. I agree. Hey, I've got to uh, I've got to jump to another call. Uh, but you guys, if you want to jump back in the queue, I don't think you're probably going to make it. I got a slew of calls, so I got to grab. But thank you guys for holding on for as long thanks as you did. Okay. Us, man. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. Have a thanks, good one, guys. guys. Stay cool in Beverly yeah. Hills. All right. Here we go. Let's pick up. Uh, let's jump right over to Twin Cities, Minnesota. Six one two area code. You're on with Strange Worlds Industrial. Vacuum expert night. What's going on? Hey, Mark. What stays flat earth news talk? Wait for it. Uh, uh, Wes, there we go. why do you insist on calling my show every week? I do not. Oh, I don't know. Just, just torment. torment. I, it is torment. torment. And you know, you gotta What's up? I was the guy that came down in the middle of the night and overheard my parents say, and he's not adopted. Um, <laughs> I think maybe they just wanted to make sure that, you know, I actually have good parents and not bad parents, whatever. It's funny. Ah, uh, stupid joke. Um, <laughs> uh, I have yeah, a quote Mark, for you. Mark from New York. Mark from New York, he does have a great radio voice. I'm yeah. kind of holding out for the uh, the 
reality show. So, all right. Then heck, who knows yeah, with this okay. with flat Here's Earth, you, it is uh, it, it could happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyhow, nice to meet you, Gary. Wait, wait, wait! Don't uh, go! Wait! Don't go! Up. Don't go! I've got a quote for you. No, no, I'm not going to go. I was ready to say something. <laughs> oh, okay. What is it? What what I was going to say is that I love everything that you guys are talking about with the ISS and everything, but nobody ever stops and thinks. Yeah. They say that thing is uh, traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, and the heat is 17,000 degrees. Right. I'm sorry, people. Logic would say that metal melts at 2,000 degrees. Right. Hello. I agree. I agree. Combine that with a vacuum of space. So it kind of blows everything else out of the water. Yep, there is nobody up there. They'd all be dead. Plain and simple. Yeah. Plain and simple. Uh, the quote of the day from the peanut gallery, especially for Wes from Flat Earth News, believe those who are seeking the truth, doubt those who find it. That's from Andre Guide? G-I-D-E? Guide. I'm going to say Guide. Oh, very, very wise, very wise quote. I thought so. I thought so. Anything else? All right. Well, cool. No, that was it. I was just say hi to everybody. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, you have a good rest of your evening, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, okay? Yep, and I'll continue to torture you every week. Thank you, Wes. So kind. You're welcome. Later, dater. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> That's Wes calling from what I assume is a prison cafeteria where <laughs> you're using his one call for the day. Uh, let's go to 512 area code. I believe that's out in Texas. Texas. What's going on? Hey, Mark. Hey, Jerry. How you guys doing? Hey, it's, it's Chip Baker. <laughs> it is Chip Baker. How you guys doing? One subject I had not heard mentioned tonight was how does refrigeration, um, climate control relate to a vacuum? You know, A, wouldn't they effectively be just in the middle of a big thermos bottle in our infinite vacuum of space, alleged? And Ooh. then, you know, how, does, how do you transfer the heat? We've heard the story of, you know, the astronauts, um, I guess, sublimating water out of the back of their backpacks, you know, to create that differential. But I, I still haven't heard it from anybody, a vacuum expert. Let's talk, you know, refrigeration, climate control. We got Jerry. Yeah, I think <laughs> I didn't have to do a lot of climate control with what I had. We had a bake out process that we would actually use to help bring the chamber into vacuum. Um, because like, say I would uh, clean a thing or wipe a chamber down with IPA that would still leave some moisture in there and we would bake it out to help, um, to help speed up the process. Um, because that would severely dampen the uh, pump down time. Pump down time was huge in the semiconductor industry, but I didn't do. I I, I don't sure. want to touch into an area that I really that I really didn't deal with. Okay, that's right. I wasn't I wasn't in HVAC, you know, where I was doing you know heating and cooling scenarios. So I can't speak a lot. Sure. I, well, I just heard yeah. I heard a guy who called in on Mark's show. Um, uh, he had referred to himself as being a, uh, a refrigeration technologist. And he, you know, he was also questioning, you know, where does heat go if it isn't truly a vacuum? And don't, you know, as kids, don't we get that? You know, I'm, I'm old enough to I remember the actual glass vacuum bottle you'd have, you know, with that little glass piece. You can right. actually replace that if it broke. You know, you would pull that out, put it back in, and your, your soup would be hot all day or your, you know, whatever you had to keep cold all day. Wouldn't, you know, I've heard that, that I don't know if this is accurate, but the human body puts out something the equivalent of a 100-watt bulb. Now, you got, you know, a number of, of astronauts in there. It's just going to continue to heat up and heat up. And I remember, uh, and this is, gosh, many years back, because NASA's been pulling this garbage for years, but there was something about the air conditioning that failed, of course, and the astronauts were getting all hot. And, you know, and then at the same time, they're telling us in Apollo 13, you know, they're freezing. Then you got the whole rotisserie thing where we spin the, the you know, we're spinning the capsule, you know, keep it. You know, it's, like, it's a rotisserie. I spin my chicken. It cooks on all sides, you know. So some of this stuff ends up, you know, just the same ludicrous, transparent stuff that they spin to us. And I think they're just really counting on the fact that people are lazy. You know, no one's going to, they're just used to getting their news, you know, oh, sure, this is what it is. It, you know, here's, here's Mars, Pluto on, you know, the picture of Pluto on Pluto, you know, just gotten pretty right. ludicrous as it were. Right. Well, no, no, this, know, go ahead, um, Jay. Oh, okay. I was going to say, we did kind of, I don't know if you heard that talk earlier, and I don't know which aspect you were questioning, but, um, you know, as your vacuum does go down, boiling points definitely um, lower in temperature. Sure. 
So, so yeah, but you got to realize that chamber is, you know, maintaining atmospheric pressure. So, you know, inside mm-hmm. it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be affected. Um, I think the only thing sure. that would is if that sun's hitting, you know, the way they say it hits, you, it should be, they should have some pretty serious heating and cooling problems if things work the way they say they do. Right. And, and you got a sure. big question okay, here because now, go, go ahead, Chip. Oh, I was, I was going to ask a slightly unrelated question. He had mentioned guitar manufacturers of tube amplifiers. And I just wanted to know what the tour level over the average vacuum tube was. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, That's that a good I look that one up. Okay, while you're looking up. Well, I know what a TV is. Oh, what's TV tube? Uh, the old sure. cathode ray TVs were a negative seven tour. Right. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, got it. Um, one other thing, Mark, I wanted to mention. There's something you had mentioned a couple shows back. And you were talking about the metric system, you know, and how the, you know, in America, we were just holding on to the it's English a- system. Yeah. Uh, I want to make one point that the metric system, the meter was derived from the measurement of the so-called, you know, ball earth from the pole to the equator from a meridian that ran right through Paris, which is one ten millionth of that distance. So hmm. the meter, the metric system is entirely ball earth derived. Whereas uh-huh. if you look at the, say, English system, it was the cubit. It was the human body. The inch was the length of a digit in your fingers, right. or roughly so, and weights and, and the measures foot, and so forth. And, so yeah, one yeah. appears more di- divinely, you know, re- referred to, and the other one is clearly based entirely on the ball earth. So that's you know what? More, that's more um, neat to chew on it. I have not heard anyone mention that. That's fantastic. That the metric system is based on the sphere measurement, and the other system, whatever you want to call it, is based on us. That's great. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I just did. That's another, you know, like I said, more, more uh, arrows into the to the fire, if you will. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know right, me. I love arrows hey, in the I fire. Will, I will say this: that this vacuum thing has always sat with me because the idea of a, a an infinite vacuum. And you know, Mark mentioned the Michelin Man thing. Um, Ralph Rene, God bless him, before he passed away, did a video in which he put. A, a rubber glove and he built his own vacuum chamber and he put his hand and he said it was like steel. He said he could absolutely not move that glove. So wouldn't, wouldn't a high vacuum like that make these things into essentially rigid structures, right? Absolutely. Yes. And that you got to realize that that wasn't even down to one tour. And you're, you're no, you're not even in the ballpark of what the vacuum space is. I mean, you, you have no right, comprehension right, I, how radical that vacuum is. I mean, you look at the chamber. Oh, well, they're telling us if, if you talk about an infinite space, the vacuum would have to be near infinite, you know, by definition. You know, any, any equation you punction, you know, you put I- I- infinity into is going to kind of level that equation right. right out off the bat, I would think. Well, yeah. here's, so, here's what I All right, I, Mark. Great talking okay. to you guys. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. Any, any shout-outs before you go? Oh, no, everybody out there, like, everybody likes to hear Mark's voice. He's got a great tone of voice. Wes, God bless him. Let's hope he gets on parole soon and, uh, you know, gets out on the streets. Um, I love the phrase patter, Patricia. That's fantastic. And uh, once again, the conference was fantastic. I'm sorry I missed it, but, uh, you know, I watched every single instant of it, absorbed cool. everything, all the media, every last bit of it. So, you know, it was a win-win for everybody. Right on, man. Cool. Uh, I'm uh, sure you and I will run into each other. Go ahead. Uh, well, you know what? Tell tell Pat to have a meetup. We'll fly you down. All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. You have a good one, Mark. All Take right. See you. See you. you bet. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All right. That was Chip Baker. Uh, let's do a quick recap. Um, and I want to tell a, a quick story before we go as well. Which is, I was thinking about something before I went to the conference, uh, and it was about, because people are saying, you know, are you, are you launching this big war against science? And I'm saying, no, no, I'm not. You know, we all work with science every day, and there's some really great stuff that has come from science. What I don't like, and Robbie Davidson touched on this, was the idea of scientism, where yeah. science starts to make leap of, leaps of faith, I'm sorry, leaps of faith where they shouldn't. Uh, the biggest, of course, is that, and Neil deGrasse Tyson said, uh, that science is true whether you believe in it or not. And I thought that was one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard. And if Neil is ever listening to this, or any other scientist for that matter, let me throw out another name for you, which, in fact, you, Jerry, may know this name, and that is Kelvin. Yeah. 
William Kelvin. I got to mention this guy because he sticks out like a sore thumb in the world of physics. And that is William Kelvin, who was raised in England, and he is the father of thermodynamics. Anyone that knows anything, you've, you've wondered, it's like, where have I heard that name before? Absolute temperatures are measured in Kelvin. Yep. He was at the top of his game. He was knighted. He was absolutely, he, he blew Neil deGrasse Tyson out of the water in terms of accomplishments. Maybe not movie roles, but definitely accomplishments. Uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson can't hold a candle to him. Physicists use this guy's name in every university every single day. And yet, at the top of his career, when he was addressing all sorts of things like the Royal Society, he came out and said that heavier than air flight will never ever happen <laughs> he also said that balloons are the only thing you're ever going to get up there and he has no faith not one molecule of faith and that's how he said that in the aeronautical society and this was not something that was done a long time ago he did not say this in the 1600s or the 1700s he said this in 1900 and a few years later they started building airplanes now did he know that the internal combustion engine was going to make huge leaps and they were going to figure out a way to make heavier than air flight? No, he did not. But the point was he made the statement and he had no right saying it. And he was 100% positively, absolutely wrong. So when Neil deGrasse Tyson comes out and says that science is right, no matter what, <laughs> has no credibility whatsoever. Anyway, that being said, Jerry, would you like to plug anything before we let you go? Because unfortunately, the show is coming to a close. <laughs> oh, yeah. About, I'm going uh, go, to be... go ahead. Oh, I said I'm going to get I'm getting ready to do a series. I decided after do this doing this show, I'm going to do a uh, one and I'm going to call it NASA pass or fail. <laughs> nice. That's All awesome. Right? That's and, awesome. And basically, I'm going to treat them like they're my student. <laughs> and we're going to run them through scientific tests and say pass or fail. We'll go over the seals and all different kinds of things. That's great. I'm looking forward. Is that going to be on your Globe Vandal? Yeah, channel? Globe Vandal Demos. And check out the other two because I've got like four or five videos on there, I think. Um, but the good ones are the Real Men of Genius. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty funny. Um, they're just short, like two minute videos. They get the point across in a humorous way that you know, that one way or another, you'll enjoy it, even if you don't believe it. So <laughs> awesome. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Sounds, sounds fun. And thank you for coming on and thank you for reaching out. I, I was looking for a subject matter expert and it was a great week, great month for flat earth between the Boston Celtics and mad Mike and the rocket. Hopefully don't crash. I'm crossing my fingers and the, uh, the conference and what else happened this week? Uh, the, um, there's something else I was going to do. Oh, and Patricia Steers, 200th episode, which I'm going to be on tomorrow. Anyway, we're heading out of here. Say goodbye, Jerry. Goodbye. Once again, take a look at my NASA's Mars picture taker guide by the Globe Vandal. Thanks right for on. having fun and have a good night. All right. I'll be here next week. Same flat time, same flat channel. See you, everybody. Stay on for a sec, Jerry. Geocentric Earth? <laughs> nice. I had to make a new one. What are you doing? <laughs>